Welcome back. Last time we discussed the distinction between jihad and irjaf, which raises the crucial question of how does irjaf or terrorism emerge? This issue is a subject of a very large literature, but suffice it to say here that the scholars at Al-Azhar University, the Oxford Cambridge of the Islamic world except even older, maintain that there are necessary political and intellectual conditions for this inversion. This view is represented in the upper left corner of the table. That is, the terrorists deviate from the Islamic intellectual and legal heritage on one hand, and use U.S. foreign policy regarding the Islamic world as an excuse to kill Americans on the other. For example, bin Laden and others claim that Muslims are dying because of American foreign policy, that Americans should die until U.S. foreign policy changes, and that attacking the United States will change the cost and benefits of American foreign policy, which they maintain is controlled by special interests. Bin Laden himself stated that every dollar Al-Qaeda spent on the 9-11 attacks caused over a million dollars of economic damage to the U.S. This is what I call the economics of terrorism. It's based on the idea of bleeding one's opponent economically. The strategy worked against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, and Bin Laden attempted to use the st same strategy against the United States. But it failed because 9-11 was Irjaf, whereas the war against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan was Jihad. Now, President George Walker Bush denied that U.S. foreign policy had anything to do with 9-11. He said that the terrorists hate us for who we are, for our democracy and so forth, not for what we do. But President Bush also stated that the attacks were a deviation from Islamic principles, and that the war against terrorism was not a war against Islam. This view is represented in the upper right corner of the table. Some Christian leaders, like Jerry Falwell, criticized President Bush for stating that Islam was a peaceful religion, claiming that bin Laden, who majored in engineering and public administration with no training in Islamic studies, Islamic law, let alone Islamic theology, had the right interpretation of Islam. Moreover, U.S. foreign policy had nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks. This view is represented in the lower right corner of the table. Finally, bin Laden himself would agree that he did not deviate from Islamic principles, but that U.S. foreign policy was entirely to blame for the 9-11 attacks. This view is represented in the lower left corner of the table. At the end of the course, we'll return to these necessary political and intellectual conditions in the context of our discussion of Islam in the modern world. But what I want to emphasize here is that properly identifying the Quranic term for terrorism as irjaf rather than jihad can help eliminate the necessary intellectual conditions for terrorism, since it's a capital crime and the punishment is hell in the hereafter if a terrorist doesn't repent before he or she dies. I've written a paper on this issue entitled The Economics of Terrorism, How Bin Laden Has Changed the Rules of the Game, in which I apply game theory to model this Machiavellian deviation from Islamic principles, in case anyone is interested in further reading. So a proper understanding of jihad reveals that it's not a sixth pillar of Islam, but within all the pillars. In fact, all of the rights of all religions require effort since they require us to go uphill, not downhill, so to speak. And there's a very deep metaphysical issue involved here. In the same way that you let a stone go, it falls. The soul left by itself falls like a rock. It always likes to do things that are bad for it. It's like eating. We always like to eat things that are bad for us. Very rarely do we like to eat things that are good for us. So the rights of all religions are like forcing a stone to go up. It needs effort. It needs exertion. You don't need any exertion to let a rock drop, but you always need exertion to lift it. 
And that's why in all major world religions, the rights need exertion on our part. In Islam, jihad is therefore part and parcel of all the rights. And it's this positive symbolism of jihad that to a large extent defines Islamic life. This image is contrasted in the minds of many people with the central image of Christianity, which is peace, which for the Islamic mind comes as a result of exertion. Christianity emphasizes more the role of Christ as the Prince of Peace. And that's another very important aspect of religion. That is, what is the result of jihad, of exertion? It's peace. But neither religion can be without the other element, obviously. Islam itself means peace, but it's the result of this jihad. Finally, I want to turn your attention to an empirical study entitled Body Count, a quantitative review of political violence across world civilizations. The study attempts to quantify the human death toll of religious and political violence throughout the last two millennia, adopting a civilizational taxonomy that includes secular ideologies such as communism. The results are remarkable and bring light rather than heat to this crucial issue. Modern Western civilization always talks about world peace. But how is this possible if Western civilization is at war with the world of nature, as the environmental crisis makes clear, and even with itself, as social escapism and violence make clear? We'll return to these questions at the end of the course. This concludes our discussion of jihad, and next time we'll return to the specific articles of faith in the Hadith of Gabriel.